thank you all for coming. I'm uh, John Persley. Uh, I have a little company called Persley Design. Uh, it's really my retirement project, and uh, it's all result. This particular cloud has resulted from uh, my uh, building a sea ray and then experiencing uh, water flying and in the early phase of that during uh, my transition training. I was uh, with my instructor, and he said, uh, we're just going to do a low pass over this uh, flat water, smooth water, and uh, don't land. And right when he said land, boom, we bounced off the water, even when I was realizing how close we were to it. And that was my first kind of harsh uh, realization that um, I might want to avoid the smooth water or not uh, land on it. I wasn't. From there, uh, that was nine years ago. And uh, within a couple of years, uh, we started thinking about how to uh, instrument these approaches to smooth water. And the very first thing, uh, in my experience, I look around at, at uh, some of the technologies that already exist. And uh, in this instance, uh, there really wasn't anything for the small aircraft, the planes that I could afford. Other than maybe uh, holding a full depot distance measuring thing out the window and looking at the numbers on it, so that's going to work out. So um, as we as we progressed, uh, with the help of some of my uh, very experienced pilot friends, um, started thinking in terms of flying what I've done all my career, all my life. I've done uh, product development, instrument uh, development, specifically for non-destructive testing for the most part, using gamma rays, X-rays, sometimes sonar, sometimes infrared. Uh, but in the course of it, um, we uh, developed some design goals to uh, see if we could come up with something that might work for us. And uh, this was the, the set of goals that were established in 2013. Uh, now, eight years or six years ago, uh, we wanted it to be self-contained and small, lightweight, as opposed to, to instruments that might be made for, for larger aircraft. Um, in order to accomplish that first step, we need to have miniaturized electronics. Uh, if it was going to be an ultrasonic-based system, or a radar-based system, or a laser-based system, uh, it had to have small components and, and small transducers or antennas. Uh, it had to be very low power. We didn't want to put, it, put a lot of load on the, on the power of the, of the aircraft. Uh, at the time, we thought starting at about 20 feet would be good. Uh, it needed to be higher than that. And so that was what we set our goal down, and, and we wanted to be able to talk from 20 feet down to a foot. Uh, if distance resolution, its accuracy in, in making those distances, we thought it was probably fine if it was three inches. Uh, plenty close enough. Uh, and you know, at first we did some prototypes with some lights on the panel, which transitioning from green to yellow to red. Um, my more experienced uh, consultant pilot that that really isn't a good idea. You distract yourself from, from the final phase of flight. You're already busy enough, and you just need to talk to your headset. So that was a, another uh, early goal that we set, and uh, that maintained to this day. My my experience is, is across the spectrum, I, and I usually try to make myself look at this spectrum chart. I saw one of these when I was first in eighth grade science class, and uh, I was kind of uh, intimidated by it a lot of data there that didn't make any sense to me. But bottom line, everything that we can manipulate uh, within the electromagnetic spectrum is demonstrated on this chart. It's all the way from subsonic up to the audio range that we can all hear, and the ultrasonics, and the radio frequencies, which include the, the HF, the VHF, the UHF, microwave, and then uh, into a, an area called uh, T waves, and then we get into the uh, low end uh, the, results in the visual flight spectrum, with the far infrared, near infrared, and then uh, and the visual that, that our eyes can see. And that's where laser light is, is generally manipulated. And then we go above that and get up into the, into the ray region, X-rays and gamma rays. And I've spent most of my career in the X-ray and gamma ray equipment business and developed some specific uh, new detectors for those environments and the use of an aerospace particular fuel rods and lots of other applications. But in this instance, what seemed to make sense is that we look at things that are already used for distance measuring. Ultrasonics, of course, many of us have seen the devices you can buy at the Home Depot that measure the distance between here and the wall over there uh, using ultrasonics. Uh, you can do the same thing with laser. Um, radar, not so much. Radar is typically a, 
more expensive and larger system. But we wanted to consider opportunities in each of those areas to see if we could solve this problem. So, laser, ultrasonics, radar. What are the characteristics and as it applies to um, being able to tell how far you off your, your airplane is off from smooth water, or any surface for that matter. And uh, one of the characteristics of laser is that it penetrates water. So it shoots right through the surface of water. And some of it's absorbed, but some of it will get off the bottom and come all the way back up again. So if you're getting a measurement off, off of the time of flight from laser, uh, it's not the water surface itself, it's somewhere below that. So that wasn't very useful to us. Uh, all of these technologies use a pitch catch mode of operation. There's a pitch out signal, usually a pulse of energy, and you wait for it to come back. If, if you're dealing with uh, ultrasonics and radar, they reflect very nicely off of water surfaces, whether it's a very rough surface with waves and all, or if it's very smooth, it doesn't matter. They reflect also off of concrete and asphalt and grass and dirt. Uh, so that seemed to be a, a good opportunity. As we looked at the differences between those ultrasonics and radar possibilities, um, one of them, uh, well, first of all, ultrasonics was available. I could buy transducers, industrial transducers that worked really nicely for, for measuring distance accurately using ultrasonics, and that was available. Radar, however, was not. In other words, if I go out and try to find a radar system to play with, uh, you get into either uh, surplus equipment that's 10 or 20 years old, if you want to buy new stuff, you can spend uh, anywhere from twelve to thirty thousand dollars on it. So and it's bulky. It's got ray domes for receiving, for transmitting. It's, it was effectively out of range for this project. So that got us into uh, using ultrasonics. What we found when we first started producing this product and, and uh, using it on airplanes was that the ultrasonics worked really well when you're in that low range, that low level, uh, thirty feet down to the ground, the short distances and all that, so long as you fly relatively slow. And so by that I mean 100 miles an hour or less. Uh, I've been a boater all my life and I've used fish finders and depth sounders and one of the things I discovered when you have one of those is that it works really nicely if you're going slow and controlling it. As soon as your boat picks up some speed, all of a sudden there's lots of noise signals in your ultrasonic image and pretty soon it's useless in terms of seeing fish or even the bottom. Up and get 30 miles an hour on a boat and there's an ultrasonic transducer, fish finder, and have you all and they're useful. Exactly the same thing experienced in airplanes. Uh, work pretty well until we got up in the 80, 100, 110 mile an hour range. Once you're up in that upper uh, speed, uh, no matter your altitude, uh, it, would, it would send so many false signals back. And we spent literally a couple of years in software trying to filter out those false signals and not speak them, so they only speak things that are real. Uh, that, as uh, we all learned, was, uh, was a challenge that was almost overwhelming. Uh, we started this whole effort five and a half years ago, and we only now have a product that we feel confident we can put in the marketplace, and we had to abandon ultrasonic because of the false signals. And another pretty significant thing is that if you're flying at 100 miles an hour, 30 feet above the surface, ultrasonic signals travel at the speed of sound. It takes um, about 60 milliseconds for the, the round trip for an ultrasonic pulse. And in the meantime, the airplane's moved to eight feet. So it's very easy to outrun your return signal. So we had to be careful about how we pointed the transducer so they could pitch out in front of the travel a little bit so that then we could travel over and still could get back to our transducer before we, before we outran it. Uh, it basically limited us to 100 miles an hour and 30 feet. Anything above that or faster than that, ultrasonics wouldn't be able to keep up. In the meantime, by 2016, is where we're at now, uh, at this stage of evolution, uh, radar began to become a possibility. And that was really inspired by the radar on our automobiles. Uh, collision avoidance systems uh, began to show up. There's a development company south of Austin where I was living uh, that had picked up a big contract to develop and build and sell uh, about 4 million of these radar units per year to automobile manufacturers. And I got talking to those folks, they didn't really want to deal with my little activity, but I did learn a little something from them. And uh, I saw what state of development they had in terms of the size of the radome, the size of the electronics box that it took to support it, the amount of electricity to, to run the whole thing. And it was headed in the right direction. It was still too bulky, too expensive, too, too big uh, for, for this application, 
but I can see technology trend and it made me optimistic about it. So we started focusing all of our effort. Uh, I have a team of people who are employees of my former company. Uh, I sold my product development company after building it up for 18 years. Uh, I sold it to ITW and uh, that's when I retired. That was eight years ago. And I have former employees who now work for Teledyne or some other company, but they're, they're willing to work for me on the side. And so we formed a little team to develop this effort, and uh, that's, that's how we've managed to do it. Um, any regular company, any sensible company, would have had to put together a budget, round up a bunch of money, and go after a product development project that would have resulted in, in spending a ton. And, uh, and ultimately, I wouldn't be able to put a product in the market at the price point we're trying to do. Uh, so we went on into radar, radar altimetry, abandoned ultrasonics entirely, and just a little background. Uh, radar was first invented, uh, radar altimetry was first invented in 1924 by a man from Connecticut, Lloyd Espenshaw. Uh, it was first used on an aircraft during World War II by the U.S. Army Air Corps. And there's a nice display at the uh, Oshkosh Museum that, that talks about this. It shows the early equipment and so forth. It was the very first versions of radar altimetry. And then, of course, it went on to become used on military and commercial airplanes and airplanes across the board. For the most part, it was done by way of presenting either a dial gauge information with some, some bugs on it uh, that would be in front of the co-pilot, or maybe a Nixie tube or some digital readout. And the co-pilot would watch that, and he would report it over the intercom to the pilot. That's some decision point, for example, or where they would want to flare, or whatever, whatever they worked out. Uh, and that was standard practice up until the last few years where it actually became verbalized into the headset the pilot. The co-pilot didn't have to read it and speak it. So in our process of, of developing this radar altimeter, uh, some of these components were certainly available in the marketplace. We could get radomes for transmit and see. We can get radar modules. Uh, we had to do our own CPU portion of this and the digital voice module were ours. But other parts of were out there but they were just too big. They were, they were bulky, they were expensive, and uh, it just wasn't going to fit with what we were trying to accomplish. So uh, about two years into this, we were able to uh, develop what amounts to now the only version of this kind of a, of a miniaturized radar system that exists on the Earth, as far as I know. I've tried to keep up with this, and uh, I don't think there's another example of a, of a radar system built on this scale in any application anywhere, including on the front of cars or whatever. Uh, the first versions that we started prototyping and, and testing, uh, this was one, this was prototype number 28. Uh, in 2017, we were about a year and a half into the radar part of our development. Uh, it was specifically uh, set up to, to mount on a Sea Ray uh, strut. The angle of the, of the housing was such that it met the 22 degrees as the strut comes off the fuselage. Uh, it has uh, just the, the radar system outside the aircraft, and then the cable comes in and splits out into audio going to your directly your headset or into your MP3 input to your intercom, or maybe wired into your auxiliary on your intercom. And then the other connection is to DC power. Uh, the system can use anything from 5 volts up to 36 volts as an input power. Typically, it's 12. Plug in anything along those lines into that into that uh, connector out here. So this is where we were at in 2017. Uh, we went through an awful lot of testing. Uh, our software had to be modified to get from the ultrasonics to the radar. But thankfully, we'd already had all the details worked out. We had talking to to a voice enunciator. We had a computer that put our own software on it. We had a lot of these things worked out because of the ultrasonics, and we could basically plug the radar uh, devices into the front end of it and just work on that, which which really helped us a lot. So what it does, uh, in this case, uh, this is mounted on a C-Ray. Uh, test pilot is sitting right here. Uh, and that gives up to blue boost pops on, flaps are coming. Flaps are set. Power is set. Looking at about one to two hundred foot per minute descent. So those of us who trained to get a seaplane rating, this is a standard procedure. 
get visually set up over the last point where you know you're above the surface, and then you set a rate of descent that's, that's uh, minimal. 30. And then it's, this will start stopping to you. 20, 15, 10, 8, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1. Twenty, fifteen, ten, eight. So this was the six, testing over the top of vegetation. Six, where we had spent a lot of time trying to figure out where's the radar going to bounce off from? Is it going to go off the top of the wheels, eight, the lily pads, the brush? Ten. Or for the ten, represent the, the surface of the water. Thirty degrees of bank. Once they get out there, they want to know 
when they're at 100 feet again. And uh, so this is something that's now uh, in testing with them. Uh, they've got nine of these aircraft, uh, and they're off season right now, thankfully. So they're, they're doing their testing with it. We don't know yet uh, about how much canopy it picks up on, whether it's going to strictly look to the ground, or whether it is going to get some distance off the canopy. Uh, we're going to find that out from them. This is all very current information. Something else that we've, we've come to learn, which is fascinating to me, is because we, we put these systems, data systems on aircraft and put a data port on our flare assist and route another wire into the cockpit and hook it up to a laptop, we, we data log the results and we get landing profiles. And, and we've used it to establish you know, the, the accuracy of our calls and you know, rates of descent under certain conditions and all that. Now in this case, it's the same airplane on two different touch and goes. Uh, the data began being reported here at about 70 feet on both of them. And you see that the, the, the rate of descent was about the same at the beginning of that down to maybe uh, 55, 60 feet. And then what we, are, what we believe is the case is that the, this is over asphalt runway. And you, you come over the threshold and there's some lift because of the, the heat of the asphalt. This was in Austin, Texas. And the, uh, the lift then was more intense on the first one, maybe picked up 10 feet, and then the, the following settling happens. And that went okay, except that now, because of the lift and the settling, a little under airspeed, the pilot kicks in a little power. Power is kicked in maybe right here. Uh, change the, the um, approach angle. Now, float not there, you've got to burn that airspeed off, the power's pulled back, and then you start the descent again. And, but now you still carry more airspeed than you would have had you continued without that lift and settle. And as a result, you get clear out here, much further distance down the runway, and you finally touch down. The second profile, the green one, uh, is what we all like to have is just a nice controlled rate of descent and yeah there's some fluctuations but they're pretty minor no power was added and basically get to the runway in the sh at a reasonably short distance one of the aspects of this that we think uh, as, as i've shown this to different people in the training industry is that this might be real useful if you've got a, a training scenario you've got a, a student pilot you're going out and doing 10 touch and rows in a row Sometimes they flare a little high, sometimes they flare a little low, low sometimes they're adding power or they're not adding power. Anyway, you can log the specific um, profiles of each of these landings and then come back and talk it over. You know, here's, here's what happened in this instance and the result, how far you went down the runway. Uh, here's, here's, you know, trying, trying to get, of course, the trending towards better performance in the pilot. Uh, all of us, I think, as, as student pilots have to learn the sight picture. we got to know when we're supposed to review resting our rate of descent, we've got to know when to flare. And, and that just comes from doing it and our instructor commenting to us about it as we do it. But I think if, if uh, as I now, when I fly this, I fly my plane consistently, uh, it's very, very helpful to have a, to have those enunciations come through 30, 20, 15, 10, 8, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the sequel, the, the uh, rate in which those words are spoken uh, conveys to me that I'm on the kind of rate of descent that I really want to have. If they start getting too fast, and I know I'm really coming down a little fast, i got to get a little stick. So it's, it's very, very handy uh, in, in hearing those words and, and having the sight picture reaffirmed. You know, what you're seeing is what you really are doing. So this is uh, the, the folks that have been very involved with this project. Um, I have a, a career of, of product developments in, in electronics and, and I've led the team on this. Uh, I have a, a software designer who's uh, very, very good and, and he has been willing to spend his time and effort on this uh, over the years that we've been doing it. Uh, we have an electronics designer who's, who's an employee of mine for 20 years. We're really a brilliant young man who works for Teledyne Corporation out of Scandinavia uh, now. Uh, but he was a fellow Alaskan when he worked for me. And um, 
uh, our person really involved in this has been you know, Dr. Dan McKenzie, who's sitting here um, as, as a really valuable consultant. He's the one who told me, you know, put the lights on the panel. You've got to have a voice and a headset. Uh, Dan is uh, uh, very experienced as a, as a test pilot, or as a, uh, a fighter pilot, and then a Delta captain. Uh, he brings the kind of real-world knowledge of experience that I don't have and uh, has been our test pilot on this project since day one. Uh, also, uh, Jim Ratty uh, has been the consultant and, and now a product representative on this. Uh, I, I come to really know and appreciate Jim and his knowledge of the Sea Ray and other small seaplanes and just his overall uh, understanding of what it is we're trying to do and how to do it. So I'm very grateful for that. I have some other slides here, and they, they don't relate to flare assist directly, but they relate to my background. They're just, I think, six slides. Uh, but at this point, uh, are there any comments or questions about the flare assist? Shooting down there. 
and also uh, we've learned that it works very well in spite of fog and dust and blowing rain. Um, so we haven't we haven't encountered any limitations associated with the environment around the airplane at the time it's being used. We're hopeful that uh, at Southern Fund this year we will be able to get more uh, uh, confidence about how it can be put on a certified airplane. Right now we just don't quite know where we're at on that. We're working that direction. Just a little background. Uh, I, I moved to Alaska when I was uh, 19 years old. I was in engineering school in Cincinnati and uh, it was during the course of a very tumultuous time in those days, the, the uh, civil rights movement and the anti-war stuff. And, you know, just so much going on in Cincinnati was a hotbed for that. We had curfews every night, couldn't walk on campus. And I was, I had grown up in a small town in North Idaho and I just wasn't ready for a city racial conflict environment. And, uh, and I wanted to get out of there. So I, I went to Alaska uh, in the summer of 68 and uh, continued to college. But I, uh, I got a work study job on carbon material and I got hired as a radio man. I had always played this electronics throughout my life at that point. And, and uh, some of the first stuff that I did, this was in 72, but we were a small team. There was only four of us in the, in the whole state of Alaska representing the various, doing work for the various agencies up there, all of the federal agencies. And uh, uh, we, we put the first radio repeaters together that anybody had ever done. Uh, we put them on mountaintops. This happened to be on Crown Mountain, the tallest mountain on the Kodiak Island. Uh, that uh, landing site was, uh, Pretty iffy, but I was willing to do it. He let me climb out of the airplane, out of the helicopter. He actually shut down, and got out of himself, and came and took my picture. Uh, I'm not sure I'd do it today, <laughs> but he did it then. So I, I continued to work at, at uh, Interior Department until I was Chief of Electronics for the Alaska Region, and uh, I got uh, kind of uh, overwhelmed by what my future might hold as a federal employee, and I decided to quit. And I started my own first business, which is an engineering service company, and I've had private business only ever since. Uh, one of the things that came along fairly early in my career was that I had a close friend who's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, he had traveled to Russia to learn a, a medical technique uh, by a doctor named Milizarov. And Milizarov had discovered that limbs could be regenerated, human limbs. Uh, someone lost a certain amount of length. They had, uh, maybe they were a genetic defect, a dwarfism, or something of that nature. Whether it was accidental, traumatic, or injury, or illness, uh, if you had lost length, uh, this procedure that he developed in Siberia uh, could be used to restore the length of a limb. And uh, my, my good friend uh, and I started the company. He continued on being an orthopedist. I developed the business and uh, ultimately uh, developed a electronic system, uh, had to go through the FDA, animal studies, human clinicals, and on and on. We finally got FDA approval, and uh, this this product has been in, in uh, service in the orthopedics industry now for, since uh, 1992, uh, I guess it was, that we actually got, got it approved by the FDA. This fellow here was our very first human uh, to have it applied to him, and he's a uh, football player with the Atlanta Falcons and, and he had already been playing for nine years, which is a long time for, a, for an NFL player, but he had injured his leg and had grown back with, a, with an angular deformity and uh, he wanted it corrected and he wanted to play one more season and that was accomplished uh, by way of this procedure with this electronics device. So I got, because of that system, I was I learned a lot about this all had to be built in such a way that, Thank you. 
built a few years earlier and they were starting to fail. And uh, Atlantic Richfield hired me to, to develop as, as a private company to develop uh, means of robotically inspecting pipelines. And uh, did this over the course of about 20 years. Uh, these, these crawlers had to be able to work uh, in really harsh environments, the Arctic North Slope, uh, winter time, 40 below, 50 below. Uh, and that got me a lot of education in how to make things work in, in that kind of harsh environment. As a result of that, I developed this, a series of unique X-ray and gamma-ray detectors. And that one on that first crawler, this detector right here, uh, and this was during the era when film was used. X-ray film was used in the medical environment, used in the industrial environment. We couldn't, couldn't do film out there. We had, we had to have a digital detector. And digital detectors, for the most part, didn't exist. So um, that was my first development of a, of a digital detector for for gamma rays. Uh, some years later, I'll show you where that migrated into one for x-rays and, and actually became the big win for me in my career. In 2003, uh, I'd already done some work for NASA. I developed an a, um, x-ray inspection system for the, for the scene where the oxygen and hydrogen fuel tanks going together inside of that center column. Uh, I've also done one for, the, for inspecting the solid fuel rocket that's on each side of the, of the shuttle. So I, I had some, already some track record with NASA and uh, this, this space fuel Columbia accident occurred and uh, it turns out that the, the system that we had built for Argonne National Laboratories was used to inspect some parts and pieces of the shuttle that were found in the Texas Prairie. And we got the best images of anyone uh, in the business. And uh, so I won the contract to my little company to, to design and build an X-ray inspection system for the shuttle wings. And uh, this, this image was uh, after the shuttle accident. No one, none of the engineers who worked for Lockheed or NASA, who were the key players in that project, uh, believed that a little piece of foam, I'm talking about a piece of foam that was inches long, about 10 inches, by 6 inches or 8 inches, weighing about a pound and a half, and it, and it came out loose and broke loose from the strut right there. And as it tumbled and slowed down, it hit the wing right there. And, uh, and it broke the wing. And the engineers didn't believe that was even possible. There was enough mass to that foam. Couldn't have picked up enough speed by the time it reached that wing to break the wing, but it did. And uh, NASA hired Boeing, Lockheed's competitor, to prove that Lockheed was wrong. And this this project on the right was a test that Boeing did um, with the wing segment off the shuttle, uh, firing a piece of foam at it. And it turns out that that foam was traveling at over 520 miles an hour relative to the wing, so it came traveling. It was traveling at the same speed as it was as it was uh, uh, accelerating, but when it came loose, it was slowing down so quickly there was a 520 mile an hour differential between the wing and the piece of foam, and it was enough to break the wing. And, and Boeing proved that was the case. They could, they could break the wing with a piece of foam. And uh, it was very difficult for the engineers involved to believe it, but it happened. So um, then NASA said that um, this, this shuttles couldn't return to flight until Lockheed Martin developed some means of looking at the remaining shuttle wings to see if that could happen to them. And uh, if there were any weak spots in them, it turns out there was a weak spot in that wing that, that Lockheed didn't know about. So um, uh, I was hired, my little company was hired to develop a, a three-dimensional x-ray system that could take each of these wing segments from existing shuttles and take them off the shuttles put them on this thing in, in uh, Grand Prairie, Texas that we built and uh, inspect each one of these wing sets and segments to see if there was any lens of any breakdown between the carbon fiber structure. And uh, we had eight months to do it from, from the original concept to delivery and we did it. It was, it was a terrible time in my life. I've never sweated so much ever. Uh, the, the risks were so high, and so high profile. We were up against Siemens and General Electric and Fuji for our competitors who tried to get the project and didn't. And, I was sure that if we didn't get it, it would, it would wipe the company out. Uh, first of all, we weren't going to get paid until we had it done. That's one thing. And then the reputation would, would have been terrible. 
But it turns out we did get it done, and they were able to successfully inspect the wings of the remaining shuttles, and they got the return of flight authority from NASA. So um, it was a, it was a huge, huge uh, potential risk for, for me and my business, but it turned out it turned out very well, and we ended up getting a, a major upswing because of it. The next uh, slide here, and this is the last one, um, that's the that imager that I told you about back from the pipeline here. Uh, when 9-11 uh, when happened, uh, there was a, a big new emphasis on counter-terror and how are we going to detect bombs. And of course, dogs can be used for detecting bombs, and x-rays at the airport, of course, are used commonly. But what wasn't available to anyone was the means of taking a, a small x-ray system into the field and hand-operating it. There wasn't anything like that. And uh, they need to be able to look in a box and it's sitting on the sidewalk or a piece of luggage in an airport or uh, maybe in the back seat of a car. Uh, and uh, we, we focused on that problem and, uh, and came up with a handheld X-ray system. Uh, these guys on the left are the, uh, the Boston uh, Police Department bomb squad. And they're coming out of the apartment where the two brothers who had done the bombing at the marathon. They hadn't caught him yet, and this photo was taken, but they didn't know where they lived. And so they went to their apartment, and they went through with, with my open vision, uh, inspecting the apartment, looking for them. They were afraid of people would be trapped. So they went in there looking everywhere. They started with the door, the doorknob, and they went on from there looking at different things in the car. It turned out that it was not movie trapped, but there was plenty of bomb making stuff in there. So uh, that, that particular incident led to quite a bit of, of notoriety to the product uh, being used in that way. Uh, we went on from there in 2013, by uh, oh, 2016, uh, about half of all the bomb squads in America uh, had bought and are using this product. And now it's, I don't know how many, uh, I sold the company in the course of that. But I, uh, kind of my last activities, I was hired back by, by ITW, who bought my company, to, uh, to help them lighten it and make it smaller. And, and by then I was pretty involved with carbon fiber and 3D printing, and, um, and I uh, helped create the latest version of a 